Hello, I'm Joe Ewins, and this is the Vixio Gambling Appliance Podcast. Germany has for several years retained its title as Europe's most complex and controversial regulated gambling market. Years of legislative debate ended in a set of regulations that it's fair to say are not universally popular. Yet the market forges on and with the promise of a re review of the law in the next couple of years. To help us understand the state of play in Germany, I spoke to Jan Verhake, a partner at law firm Taylor Wessing in Hamburg. He broke down the situation around tax rates, player monitoring, slots testing, and more, before we broached the looming subject of player refund lawsuits. Jan is one of the many speakers appearing at next week's Nordic and Scandinavian Gaming Show, which, as you may have guessed, will also feature insights from across Northern Europe. A subject like Finland's pending re-regulation of its monopoly market, also set to be high on the agenda. But for now, back to Germany. So there are uh, probably a hundred different places we could start when talking about the, the German markets. It's certainly uh, had plenty of twists and turns over, over the over the last decade, if not longer. Um, but to pick one out of thin air, perhaps let's talk about tax first. Germany has a, a pretty uh, um, hefty tax burden, certainly by uh, comparison to, to some other markets. I mean, we're some years in now to, to the kind of new era. Uh, post the interstate treaty. I mean, how is how is the market in general handling the kind of the the, the turnover tax that Germany has? Um, so, uh, uh, first of all, you're right. We are uh, uh, had a uh, 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 very turbulent uh, past in the German market um, with the tax rate um, uh, now being based on um, uh, uh, the, these actual stakes rather than um, uh, gross gaming revenue as it was um, uh, in the past. Um, it's put specifically for, for slot games a really big um, damper on, um, uh, on the enthusiasm that uh, uh, the operators had entering the market. Um, it also affects the player experience because in order to gain a little bit of profit margin um, uh, 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 under these circumstances, the operators had uh, had to reduce uh, um, uh, the the payout ratio, um, meaning that the, uh, the the likelihood of winning and the uh, and the, the the high of win is that the amount of the winnings um, has been reduced. So that has uh, also significantly affected um, um, the the experience of the player themselves, and we're seeing. Uh, a double effect that this uh, a double negative effect that this uh, new tax model is having on the market on the first on the one hand side it's getting very very unattractive for operators so we see less operators um, uh, entering the market and those that are already in the market maybe take it, uh, thinking about leaving the market or at least not prioritizing Germany as a market. And on the other hand, we also see players drifting towards um, the black market. It's just one of the contributing factor uh, for this effect that we have been seeing um, if in this in these uh, uh, last uh, uh, three years. But uh, it's it's a significant effect. And um, so this uh, th yeah this has been a rather rather large factor in making the uh, German market as unattractive to players and operators as is in the, mo uh, in the moment. So with that in mind, is there any potential for the tax rate to change? So um, the tax rate is uh, set on a national level um, and we are at the moment in a, a part of an evaluation process of the overall regulation and the tax rate is also part of that overall um, uh, evaluation. The likelihood, uh, I, I cannot speak to the likelihood because of the political nature of, uh, uh, of these things and the political influences um, that, are, that are at work here. But I know that all market participants, 
if including the state-owned uh, uh, market participants are suffering from um, uh, the, the, the high tax burden. And therefore, I could imagine that once in 2026, um, we will have a new regulation um, that this is going to be a major topic that could also be subject to change, especially since we had a tax model in the past based on gross gaming revenue, which was more attractive, even though it was still a high tax burden, it was more attractive to operators, did allow for a margin and also did allow, allow for an attractive um, uh, offer. And we, um, the, the regulator and lawmakers already have experience with a gross gaming revenue based model, also on the state owned casino side, brick and mortar casino side, where there's a, a, a similar um, a tax rate. Uh, so yes, uh, I do think that there is maybe a change, but yeah, I'm hopeful, but I cannot promise any, anything, but um, I think it's, it's going to be um, a topic of discussion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm interested um, to talk a bit about uh, Lugas, which is um, quite a unique feature of the of the of the German market. I think for for those listening may not be uh, familiar directly with the market. Could you explain what it is and and how it's how it functions? Yes. So um, uh, Lugas is um, a, a central file system. So there are basically two central systems in Germany um, uh, installed. One is the OASIS system, which is a system that is checking whether or not um, a player has self-excluded nationwide with all lic licensed uh, gambling offers. And also um, uh, operators can, uh, if, they, if they have reason to believe that this player um, has a, has a, a risky gambling behavior. They can also register that player um, by themselves to the Oasis system. The Oasis system is working reasonable, reasonably well. There are some issues with the Oasis system as well. Lugas is a central system that is supposed to do a real time check um, for the limits um, uh, uh, that um, the player has across operators and. Um, uh, also um, to check that they are not in parallel play, meaning that they don't have on one screen the offer for one um, uh, slot offering and then another slot offering on the other side. Um, the technique, the, 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 the project itself, um, anybody who has some knowledge about uh, uh, this will know that a centralized system such as this has such a high technical burden because the, 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 this, this real-time interaction is uh, so difficult um, that what has happened first was all the licensed um, operators had to pay, put real development capabilities to even connect to the system, which was fraught with a lot of difficulties. And then now we are dealing with outages, we are really, uh, dealing with service levels of this state-owned centralized systems that are not comparable to service levels of an IT service providers. Um, so it is, while the initial thought that you have a central system that runs, uh, uh, that allows the regulator to, to check everything, to, to, to allow the, the control of these um, limits, um, I think what has turned out is that it's technically and from a, also from a service perspective, if we're considering this a software service, uh, they have to conclude license, the operators have to conclude license deals with regard to Lugas. Um, it's something that's not working out really great. Um, I know that uh, throughout um, Europe, other regulators are looking at that model because in theory, it gives you like a single customer perspective, regardless of which operator they play uh, on. And so there is some interest in this, but from a day-to-day -day perspective, here advising my clients on how to deal with this, um, helping uh, get a hold of Lugas, um, it's, it's not working great. So, um, uh, we had crucial out times during important um, football games uh, uh, here, Champions League games, which obviously is 
a catastrophe for the sports betting operators. Um, uh, we have these difficulties if there's an outage over the weekend that this is not going to be fixed uh, until Monday. Um, so yes, the, it has been really, really difficult for operators and uh, makes it additionally unattractive also for uh, a new um, market and entries. So it's, it's a very high technical burden to, to fulfill this level of technical compliance. What does what happens when there's an outage? Uh, does it does it prohibit? Like, can people not effectively just not gamble on, on online when there's an outage across the whole market? So um, what has happened in the past where there were like uh, what I call a little bit of compromising here, um, then uh, to allow the operations to continue, the or the regulator has in some instances allowed them to proceed without the Lugas check going on. Um, uh, but basically, if you follow the rules of the law, basically all operations would stop. And some outages actually lead because they, they are implemented in the technical systems, they lead to less players being able to play. And um, yeah, that's obviously a, 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 big, a, a big hindrance of, of, of an attractive offering if during major events such as a Champions League game, no betting is possible. Yeah. And so there have been some workarounds uh, because the authority themselves, they are working with the regulation they have. And I don't blame them too much here because uh, if, if that's basically what's written in the law. And they have to kind of find a way to deal with it. And they sometimes find try to find compromises here. Um, and the, the technical uh, staff staff at uh, the, that's responsible for the Lugas system at um, the regulator is also quite responsive and trying to work with operators to fix these issues. Um, but just by the nature of it, having a real time centralized system with all operators um, uh, on it, it's just a very, very high level of complexity. And um, uh, yeah, it has led to, to a lot of frustration here on, on all sides. I see. Um, uh, I'm interested in your view on what perhaps the kind of shaky rollout of, of Lugas might mean um, for the rest of Europe in particular. We see in the UK, they're considering working on a single customer view project. Noises at the Netherlands might think of doing something similar. That what, what's being talked about, I think it sounds a little less uh, technically challenging than, than, than Lugas. But did you see that kind of um, uh, that kind of player monitoring as a, as a trend generally in Europe, and what do you think the the kind of German experiences teaches the other regulators? So yes, obviously, as you mentioned, it is a trend, and uh, I can see the appeal for a regulator um, uh, for for this because um, they can have a have a have a view of a, of, a, of a customer throughout a number of operators even in a developed market where there are a number of uh, operators in the market um so so i can see the appeal and why it might seem um, um interesting what i would caution every regulator looking into this is real-time centralized system it is a high level of um complexity that you're just process-wise onboarding so um, as I mentioned before, the OASIS system, a system that has less regular intervals that it checks, not real time, um, uh, but it has checks, for example, if there's an advertising going out, an OASIS check is going out, or if a player is registering or in certain intervals, um, 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 it's, it's, it's a check that has to be, uh, be done with a set exclusion base. That's working reasonably well. Um, so I, have, I think that's that's good for for player protection that you don't have that uh, a player hopping around um, a different different operators if, if specifically if it's a, um, a player that has um, this this kind of uh, uh, very risky uh, gambling behavior. Um, but uh, just to think about what this would mean on a day to day basis for a regulator and their staff. Um, basically compare what uh, an IT operator, a software company would have to deliver to have a satisfied customer. If you are switching on these goggles and taking away the goggles, you are the regulator looking at everything, but you will become an um, IT service provider. And um, I think uh, that 
will make uh, the regulator or should make the regulator think about what they're actually taking on here. Thank you. Um, to shift uh, then to online slots, which is one of the um, <clears throat> types of gambling uh, regulated federally in uh, in Germany, um, the the persistent complaint around that uh, portion of the market over the last few years has been testing, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, games needing to be individually certified over and over again, you know, with uh, for each separate operator. Um, has, is that remained as much of a challenge as it was at the start of the market? Is there anything anything that uh, that seems to be changing around that? So it has improved somewhat. Um, we have a situation where the speed um, and the volume of these games permits being issued um, has increased. Um, the regulator has standardized some of the processes by which it's checking the games. Um, uh, so, so we have, we've seen an improvement and there's now also kind of a volume of, of games in the market so that, uh, the, the operators do have an offering that's, that's worth calling an, uh, online slot offering. But having said that the, the system as it's set up was failed from the beginning. If you're going to check every game, even though it's the same game that's being deployed on uh, different operators' um, uh, websites, uh, and if you're rechecking, rechecking, rechecking the same game, um, that this is going to take an awful lot of time, uh, require a lot of assistance um, uh, from also the, the, the game providers, um, uh, uh, that uh, but that is a, a non-satisfactory um, situation. So um, yes, the system itself could very much be improved. I, I still think so that the wording of the law would allow the regulator to issue permits per game, regardless of which operator this is uh, being um, uh, deployed as. Um, they are choosing not to do that, but do it on an operator by operator basis, which costs a lot of time on their part. Uh, they're making their lives also very difficult. Um, and, and the operator's game also very, uh, diff uh, the, the operator's lives also very difficult. And additionally, you always have to keep in mind that the market has to stay attractive as compared to a black market offering. So I, I'm really convinced that specifically German uh, players, which are German people are generally rather rule following. Um, uh, uh, that's kind of our nature. And um, they would mm -hmm. like to play with um, uh, 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 legal licensed offers in Germany. But if the offer is just so much more attractive on the black side, the, 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 to turn around and play on an unlicensed uh, casino in Germany is just so much easier for players and so much more attractive uh, for players that I, I think this plays a role because obviously uh, throughout um, uh, the internet still content is king and that's also true for the gambling market. Yeah? If you're having the popular games um, and, the, and the bigger number of games, just, uh, just, uh, just the content is so much bigger on the on the black market uh, products um, than this on the licensed products. It's just um, the an example that's always used is uh, if you go to a supermarket uh, and you find milk there or or cereals, um, you may not you may only want to buy one cereal, but it just looks crazy if there's empty shelves and there's just a few boxes of cereal uh, there or just one kind of milk, um, uh, you, you, may, you may not even be interested in buying uh, f, f, uh, the, the, the half fat or zero fat or being buying Fruit Loops or, or uh, I don't know what your preference is in cereals or milk, but it just looks crazy if you go to the supermarket and have these empty shelves and it will not be enticing to a consumer. And the same is true here. If you're having a broad offering that's seemingly endless possibilities. It's just very, very much more attractive um, uh, to a consumer 
um, that even though they may flock to certain popular games uh, in the majority, it just seems more attractive if there's there's more choice. Um, I, I was going to ask you if um, you thought, as, as the law is being reviewed, that this is something that, that, that they would look at. But it sounds like your perspective is that the, this is something that the regulator could choose to, to alleviate themselves. So I guess my, my, I'll amend that to a kind of two-part question. Is one, why do you think the regulator isn't doing that? Uh, and two, is it is it something that could could be kind of more um, laid out in a more friendly way in the law and that, that, that might get looked at? Yes. So the regulator is interpreting the law in a very specific way. And if the lawmaker would make it clear that it is also fine for them to look at a game once and then it's approved for all operators, then the, uh, the regulator would be bound by that. And um, they are themselves arguing, no, they feel that they are bound um, to check it on an operator by operator level. Um, I disagree with uh, this interpretation of the law. I do think that uh, the law allows them to make an administrative act for one game that is applicable to all licensed um, uh, uh, operators. Um, so I, I do think that that would be absolutely possible um, at now already. But seeing what the difficulties were in getting this started and where we were only uh, a year ago um, uh, uh, with these uh, permits being uh, catastrophically low. Um, uh, uh, we have improved somewhat now, but I do think that it's worth looking at it in the evaluation process. Um, there has been an intermediate report on, the, um, uh, uh, on this. Uh, they are saying that they had these troubles now, they are, have same saying that this these troubles have been solved in the meantime um, i tend to disagree somewhat because uh, the system could be just so much easier um, uh, uh, based on the law right now but also specifically if we're looking at an evaluation of what has gone wrong with the um, interstate treaty um, then this is one of the major items that i would have to flag and i would urge um, the lawmakers, um, and I, I'm doing so in the conversation that I'm having, um, uh, not to repeat the same mistake uh, for the next go around. Uh, when when will we um, when will the next go around be? So it's 2026 uh, will be the uh, uh, evaluation round, and then in 2027 we are going to see the new law. Um, which could be a, just a prolongation of this current interstate treaty. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not fixed that we were going to see changes, but um, uh, this is uh, this is the, the rhythm that uh, that the, that they have to evaluate it. And then um, I think it's realistic. Also, the, the the regulator themselves has some expectations with regard to enforcement against the black market that is not working in the way that they would like it to work. Um, uh, so I, I, I do think that it needs an overhaul and um, in this intermediate report that was uh, issued over the summer, um, the, they have recognized in some points that it needed to change. I do think that they still have in some aspects uh, the wrong emphasis because uh, you're not going to make an attractive offer only by fighting the black market. but. I think always the licensed market has to be an attractive alternative. Um, otherwise, specifically in the online space, the alternative is just too easy to circumvent. And you're, if you're looking at Scandinavia, for example, um, all of the, 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 those um, countries have gone the route of um, eventually opening up um, uh, and trying to find the balance where you have the right level of um, player protection and attractiveness of the offer. And I think Germany has just way, way overdone the player protection um, side of things um, and is thereby not actually protecting players because the players, specifically at risk players, are leaving the licensed market and moving to the black market. And I, I, I think they have done a disservice um, with seemingly good attentions, but they have a disservice to the actual consumer that they're trying to protect. 
uh, we'll come to talk about the, the black market in a minute, but uh, I, I want to follow up a little bit on the, the re-regulation we're talking about, or potential re-regulation anyway. If, if they do uh, uh, opt to change a few things, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking back to the, the, the years that preceded this current interstate treaty, which were pretty tumultuous in terms of trying to get a, an agreement from all the lender. I mean, is that is that on the cards again if they do if they do decide to change it, or is it a more smooth process this time? No, absolutely not. So uh, it's going to be very troublesome and a very hard fought compromise again. So mm. uh, the 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 compromise that we have now that we see in the current interstate treaty um, has been somewhat forced by judgments by the European Court of Justice. So they the the rules that they have now established are the minimal compromise that they found to to opening the market um, because basically uh, the, the European Court of Justice had ruled that the previous systems were in violation of um, uh, EU freedoms and uh, therefore not um, uh, in line with the expectations that the ECJ has for national gambling regulation. And um, now we have this compromise, but it is a, a very hard fought compromise. And we see at the moment um, that those um, lenders which were opposed to opening the market are still the ones fighting for against all rulings that would make it easier um, for the operators to operate in Germany and offer an attractive offer to, to the players. They are still emphasizing player protection overall and do we, we hear from them that um, the less gambling there is, the better. They do not really realize um, that in order to have an attractive licensed market, uh, you basically have to take the industry on board and uh, move in that direction. So there are some um, uh, lenders who realize that and those are the ones um, that are having a moderating influence at the moment. And that led uh, also uh, with the backing of the European Court of Justice to the interstate treaty that we have at the moment. Um, I hope and uh, do think that it is reasonably reasonable to expect that the obvious shortcomings of this current version of this will be fixed because um, even to those who emphasize player protection, they have to realize that we're seeing decrease in tax rates. We're seeing a decrease in player engagement on this market. We're still seeing a growth in the, um, in, in the black market, that this is not a situation that you want to have if you regulate uh, um, uh, the market. Um, uh, so I, I do think that even with a different set of political values that don't value the freedom of the operators so much, but more the protection of the players more, um, this is the balance that they have to, that, that, that they have to find. And at the, the, the current version of the ISTG, I think in everybody's body's eyes, is not meeting the right balance because it's not effectively protecting players, not offering an attractive market. So I, I, have, I really have big hopes that um, uh, even though it's going to be a hard fought compromise again, um, the evalu evaluation um, and the new ISTG will bring some changes and hopefully in the right direction. Okay, it's gonna be very, uh, very inter interesting to see how that plays out. Um, uh, you, you've, you've made it clear, I think, that you think the black market is a, is a threat uh, to, to the online gambling market in Germany. I mean, I've seen differing estimates from the regulator and from, from industry groups about exactly yeah. how bad it is. Um, but one way or the other, I mean, what what is the regulator doing in, in, uh, to try and restrict the black market? So um, basically, they have a, have a few tools in their pocket. They tried um, approaching the uh, black market participants directly, um, also trying to fight them with criminal prosecution. However, um, that has to be, they are not a criminal prosecutor this, the, the themselves. So 
um, this um, this way of enforcement had to go through an official criminal prosecutor and the criminal prosecutors in Germany basically they investigated for a bit but found that they cannot do anything because um, these are based abroad um, uh, the black market operators and the investigations have died down now and um, the second thing that they had in that toolbox and tried was IP blocking um, um, meaning uh, approaching the big telecommunication providers and uh, doing uh, uh, IP blocking of those websites um, uh, that are offering black market in the in the in, in Germany, um, that they have been defeated in the courts uh, by the telecommunication providers who fought this, um, who don't want to make made uh, responsible for this, and also don't want to be seen as censoring the um, the internet um, uh, uh, due to uh, what the authority thinks um, is a mistake in the law. Um, but the wording of the law basically is in a way, as the courts have decided in Germany, that IP blocking at the moment is not something that they can, can use. Um, I also think taking a step back, even if this mistake in the law should be fixed, I don't think it's a great approach. Uh, we've seen that in other um, uh, European countries, for example, in Belgium, um, it just or Denmark just doesn't work if you're only trying to keep the black market out by that because you change in the URL uh, just a little bit um, um, of, of the URL and uh, it will be freely available. Also, you have a, a very freely available VPN um, uh, use. So it's, it's not something that's uh, terribly effective. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the second tool that has been blunted now. And then the third tool, which is working reasonably well, is um, uh, payment blocking. We have a high level of voluntary uh, compliance um, for um, in, the, in, the, in the payment industry. Payment services providers um, are very willingly uh, cooperating and trying, uh, 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 if they are approached by the regulator from Germany, to avoid doing business with um, uh, these kinds of uh, the black market uh, uh, operators. So um, that is something that has worked reasonably well. However, it has not prevented the growth of the black market because there's always a way around that, um, uh, that payment blocking system, be it by the use of VPNs, um, be it by um, uh, using payment methods that have so far not been um, uh, scrutinized. So, uh, or if we think a little bit further, uh, what's happening also is crypto. Um, uh, it's uh, it's basically not possible uh, to control that. So, um, yeah, what we are seeing is uh, uh, that payment blocking is the only tool where on the recipient side of the payment blocking orders they at least have a receptive audience quote unquote the the regulator it's not preventing the black market though so um yeah while i do think that 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 may be a tool that uh, the only tool that is, um, makes sense to to keep really um uh, this payment blocking i don't think it's uh, it's a solution for the problem um as with many problems there's not uh, that are complex in nature, there's not one single solution, but you have to take a number of steps. And one of the steps that I think is the most important one is to have an attractive license offering that will attract players, German players. And as long as you do not have that, you can have as much payment blocking as you like. And um, I don't think you're going to get rid of the um, uh, of, 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 of the black market in a, in a significant way. You are just throwing, we have a saying in Germany, you're throwing a little bit sand in the gears of the machine you're making it a little bit harder for players to to reach the black market and a little bit harder for black market operators to up operate in germany but you're not blocking them and um, so um uh, I, do I don't think it's a truly effective tool and i also think that they are doing too little um, against the black market they are not doing any big fines, which they could do. Um, uh, they are not. Um, they're not even using the full toolkit. Um, um, is, is what I'm saying. 
and yeah um, so they're doing not enough and also they have the wrong mindset that by restrictive measures uh, they can they can keep out the black market there's also this this analogy of a carrot and a stick um, and you if you're trying just to use the stick to force uh, somebody uh, the donkey to to do something you're not going to entice him as much as if you're uh, kind of enticing him with a carrot and trying to move them uh, over to the to the uh, to the legal side of things where you want them to be uh, understood thank you um let's move on to talk about the uh the other kind of uh key uh, product vertical uh, in Germany that's regulated a little bit differently, which is, which is uh, online casino table games, separated from uh, slots in the way that they're regulated um, uh, and devolved to the different states, if I understand things correctly. So where, that, where are we there? The individual states need to pass their own laws, right, in order to, to license this. Have any states done that? Uh, are there many operations up and running? So um, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, it has is, is done a state by state uh, a level. Um, not all uh, lender have used this opportunity. So so many are kind of taking a step back and looking at this from the outside. There's basically three big um, lender that are worth to talk about. And um, two have chosen a private model where they also allow uh, private licenses. And one has chosen a state model, uh, state-owned uh, uh, monopoly model. Um, the two states that have uh, done the private model so far are North Rhine-Westphalia and Schleswig-Holstein. In Schleswig-Holstein, uh, four licenses have, licenses have been issued. There are only four licenses available. Um, and um, at the moment, these licenses are somewhat tied up in litigation because uh, one of the applicants for a license that has has not um, uh, received a license um, has uh, sued uh, uh, the, uh, the the regulator and says you should not issue these licenses to these four and um, that you have selected um, uh, the, so this is uh, tied up in a legal battle um, we have North Rhine Westphalia which allow, will allow five private licenses um, which are um, at the moment uh, they are still preparing um, the uh, uh, the possibility to apply. So at the moment you cannot yet apply, but we are monitoring that very closely for our clients. And the third player that has moved forward um, already is uh, Bavaria, and um, they have chosen a state-owned monopoly model, and they have uh, a, a, a state-owned casino, online casino or uh, which is already go live. Um, uh, the yeah, if you ask me how uh, how how is the model working, I have to say it it's just not a good model. Yeah, mm. you do by doing it state by state. It's also a compromise that does not really work um, because um, it will be very attractive for a big state like Northern Westphalia or Bavaria with a lot of inhabitants, a lot of uh, potential to play. But you have small city states. Bremen has 500,000 people living there. Um, uh, how is that going to be an attractive offering for anybody to apply for? Uh, if the potential market is 500,000 uh, persons, you have high burden of technical um, uh, compliance to meet. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, high financial um, um, upfront investment by by the operator entering the enter, by the operators entering the market. So I do think that this needs an overhaul. Um, uh, I, I think it should be a, a German-wide license, uh, similar to the um, uh, to the other licenses that we have uh, in Germany, and should also not be limited. By the amount of licenses because in Schleswig-Holstein we see exactly what happens exactly what happens when we only had 20 slots for sports betting yeah uh, those who not do not who applied but did not get the license they are of course going to sue and then um, it's going to be tied up in a legal battle so um i i, I don't understand why they did not learn from that mistake and uh, are repeating it again here um uh, uh, 
it's not Schleswig-Holstein's fault. They were limited to these four licenses. So this interstate treaty only allowed them to issue those uh, four, uh, four, four licenses. But it's, again, a fault of the interstate treaty um, that should be reformed. And yeah, at the moment, um, there are still possibilities to look to apply for um, the license in Northern Westphalia if you're an operator. And of course, uh, for all Bundesländer, uh, there's a possibility for B2B operators in that space um, uh, to talk to um, uh, um, those looking to apply or talk to the regulator and see what the regulation is going to look like. We expect that at least in a few other states, we are going to have state-owned monopoly providers um, producing um, uh, the, 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 to have a license model that's focused on um, uh, state on monopoly. Um, so, but they still need the technical expertise to do the online casino. So that's a B2B opportunity here. Um, for B2C, I think we need an overhaul of the license model in order to make it uh, more attractive for new market entrants. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, as always, Germany, so many different complicated topics uh, to cover. So thanks for whistling through them all. Uh, let's close, though, on a, a fairly separate but related subject, which is, which is the, the issue of player refund uh, lawsuits. Um, likely those listening will, will, will know at least part of the story, something that's, that began in Austria and spread to Germany. Uh, players uh, trying and in many cases succeeding to get back their losses from operators that were previously unlicensed. Um, uh, aware that we could talk about this for several hours, probably, but um, it, the it, it, what's the situation right now? The cases are somewhat paused, I understand, in Germany because of a referral to to, to the higher courts in Europe. Is that, is that correct? Where are we? Correct. So we have still a high number of lawsuits, even the new ones that are being filed, and those still pending in the court system. Um, the uh, majority of cases are being paused at the moment due to the referral to the uh, ECJ on the sports betting side made by the Federal Court of Justice and on the uh, uh, slots side or casino side uh, made um, due to a respective ECJ um, referral from Malta, um, um, uh, so-called Lotoland case. Um, so that's basically uh, uh, the situation. Some courts are still issuing judgments uh, in Germany. Um, the majority of courts is uh, favoring players at the moment. That doesn't mean, however, that players are actually getting their, their money. Uh, Bill 55 offers protection for those operators based out of Malta, which nearly all of them were based out of Malta that are being sued uh, at the moment. So, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, as anybody who's familiar with the, this issue knows, there's litigation financing behind uh, those lawsuits. So it's while it's labeled consumer protection um, there's a, there's not really satisfied consumers that are here being reimbursed for for anything. Um, but it's um, it's it's litigation uh, financing that's in the background that's pro and law firms that are profiting um, uh, from that. Um, so um, uh, at the moment, yeah, it's still uh, uh, ongoing. We still see new lawsuits coming in. Um, but yeah, the the actual progress of resolving this issue uh, is, is somewhat halted um, uh, due to. Um, uh, to, to an expected judgment by the um, European Court of Justice. We don't expect the judgment there um, uh, in the course of this year. We expect it more uh, in, uh, in the course of the next year. So there's a little bit of a pause here, um, but uh, which is a good thing, I think, uh, that the ECJ is going to decide about it because there are some significant doubts about the systems that we have, that we had pre-introduction of the current version of the Interstate Treaty on Gambling in Germany, whether or not the previous iteration of that was in line with the European Court of Justice. 
um, they had ruled in 2016, the European Court of Justice had ruled that it was not in line um, with um, um, the expectations that they had for national gambling regulation. Um, so we do think that it's a good thing that it's being cleared on that level because um, the German courts were not able or not willing to look at that any question anymore. Um, and so I, I do think it's a good thing that this is being decided on the European level. Um, because I, I do think we will have some clarity uh, in the course of the next year on that uh, on, on that issue. And um, yeah, that's that's basically the status. Of course, we could delve into the minutia of things because as you can imagine with thousands of proceedings that we're handling, um, we uh, we do have a, a, a broad depth of, uh, uh, of knowledge here about procedural things, but I don't want to bore anybody with legalese here, but that's big picture um, the situation at, uh, on the ground uh, in Germany as, as of now. Thank you very much. I, I'm I assure you I wouldn't be bored, but perhaps we'll uh, uh, we'll save that for another for another podcast. Um, all right, that Jan, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Of course, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you very much indeed to Jan for his excellent insights. Uh, as a reminder, you can catch Jan next week from November 5th to 6th at the Nordic and Scandinavian Gaming Show in Copenhagen. I'll also be there if you'd like to say hello. For more on the topic of single customer views, you can check out our new player protection outlook, which launched recently on our website. Find it under resources in the guides section. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. The Gambit Compliance Podcast is hosted by Joe Ewens. In this episode, I was speaking to Jan Fuhake. The producer is Jack Halliday.